Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our final session of the RSET webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Scenario-Based Eco-Forecasting. Uh, my name is Amber McCollum, and today we're going to have two uh, guest speakers from the USGS, Catherine Jarnovich and Brian Miller. And um, as I've done in previous webinars, I'm just going to remind you of a few things uh, before we get started. So for this course, we have four one-hour sessions, and today is our final session. Um, we have guest speakers from the USGS North Central Climate Center. And you can find all the course materials at the website listed here. Um, and the materials are available in English and Spanish. And um, following the lecture, if there's time today, we will have a question and answer session. And um, if you don't, we don't get to your questions, you can feel free to follow up with myself or my colleague, Cynthia Schmidt, and our email addresses are listed there. We have two homework assignments um, that are to be submitted through Google Forms. Both of the links are available on the webinar website, and we have those in both English and Spanish. And we've also provided them in um, the uh, chat box as well, so you guys can um, go to those links. The, the first homework assignment is due today, uh, September 28th, and you must submit all your answers via Google Forms. The second homework assignment will be due two weeks from now on October 12th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend three out of four of the live webinars and complete both homework assignments. <clears throat> you can expect to receive your certificates about two months after the completion of the course. As I've mentioned before, there's one prerequisite for this course the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing with the website listed here or um, the similar uh, experience and background. So here again is the website for accessing all the course materials. You will be able to find um, the presentation slides as a PDF format in both English and Spanish, um, and then the links to the homework assignments. Uh, we also have the um, question and answer documents from all of the previous weeks um, on the website as well, and we will post uh, the document for today's lecture um, at a later date as well. You can also view all of the recordings um, freely available on the website here. You just need to input your information to register, and then you'll be taken directly to view um, the recording. So this week, in our final session, we'll be providing an overview of species distribution and simulation modeling. Our guest speakers will provide an overview of scenario planning and species distribution models and um, give an example. They will discuss simulation models and state and transition simulation models. And then if there's time, we'll have um, a question and answer session. So now I'm going to hand it over to our guest speakers. First, we will hear from um, Catherine Jarnovich. And if you just bear with us for a moment while we switch over to view her um, slides. Thank you, Amber. So I'm going to start out um, by giving a little review of what Brian talked about last week, he gave a good overview of scenario planning, and he talked a lot about quantitative scenario planning, uh, but, uh, or qualitative scenario planning. Quantitative information is often needed or desired, though, and a couple of quantitative methods are species distribution modeling and simulation modeling, which Brian and I will talk about today. To begin with, I wanted to provide an introduction to species distribution modeling. I'll start by giving a few examples of species distribution modeling applications. In this first example, the model informs the sampling design for surveillance for emerald ash borer, which is an invasive forest pest in the United States. And in this case, 
the species distribution model is used to determine where to sample. Similarly, models can be used to find unknown locations for other species of interest, such as threatened and endangered species. This example relates to control of invasive species. The photo on the left shows a picture of an area in southeastern Wyoming that was burned by a wildfire. And there's a distinct red color on the hillsides that's cheatgrass, which is a problematic invasive species in the western US. So in these models, we are determined to determine the actual current distribution of cheatgrass. And here we were able to use remote sensing layers from different times of the year when cheatgrass is distinct from the other vegetation, as it is in this photo, to create a model showing where cheatgrass has greater than 40% cover on the landscape. The model could then be used to obtain funding for and to implement aerial spraying of cheatgrass. Another example is to assess risk. So in this case, there were two different species distribution models created for parakeets in Australia. The first defined where parakeets have been introduced into the country, and that's the predicted incursion events. And the second model shows where the habitat is suitable for parakeets to survive. So when these two layers are added together, um, we can see where the potential for establishment of this species of concern is. Next, I'm going to describe what species distribution models are and how they're created. So what exactly are species distribution models? They are numerical relationships between species locations and the environment to define where a species may be found. So species distribution models do identify areas with environmental conditions similar to where a species occurs, but they don't necessarily identify where a species actually is. There are several different types of species distribution models, and they can be built in different ways. One way is to be based on um, ecological or physiological processes where there is information about a physiologically limiting mechanism. So on the left, there's a graph showing a species survival relation to cold temperatures. And then this information could be used to create a map of where a species might be found on the landscape. These types of models require a detailed understanding of, an, of a species and often require experimental data. And because of this, they can be difficult to parameterize because a lot of that information doesn't exist for species that we're interested in. Another way to create species distribution model models is through correlation, where we have information about the association of a species with the environment. And based on those patterns that we observe, um, we can create models. And this type of data is more readily available. So in the picture on the left, we have a map of known occurrences of a species and a set of environmental layers that we think might be important for where a species is found. These two pieces of information are fed into a statistical algorithm that can be used to develop relationships between where a species is found and the environment. And then that relationship can be used to develop maps of where we think a species might be found. There are also a couple of distinct ways in which species distribution models could be used. One is to ask the question, where is a species now, to map where a species actually is on the landscape. So on the left, 
Um, this image shows a picture of Tamarisk near La Junta, Colorado, um, where the model was created using Landsat imagery. And in this case, it requires that a species has a unique spectral signature that can be picked up through remotely sensed imagery. So Tamarisk is green at different times of the year from other vegetation. And if you remember the photo from the earlier slide where it showed cheat grass on the hillsides, that's another um, place where the species of interest has, is spectrally distinct. Um, and so in this case, you can map the actual Tamarisk stands or the actual locations of cheat grass on the landscape. On the right, that map shows a prediction of where Tamarisk might be. Um, these types of predictions could be used to examine future climates, to predict where an invasive species might spread on a landscape, to predict um, other locations of threatened and endangered species that aren't known. And this type of, of species distribution model is created generally more with um, environmental information like climate or um, vegetation layers or that sort of thing. Okay, so again, what we're focusing on, or what I'm gonna focus on in this talk is the type of species distribution models that are created by putting location information and associated environmental data into a model algorithm to determine statistical relationships that can then be used to create a map predicting where a species is or where it might be. So the way this process works is we start out in geographical space, shown on the left there. We have your X and Y coordinate. Um, the plus signs show observed species occurrence records. Um, in this graph, I'm also showing the actual distribution of the species in gray. And then in the circle, it shows the potential distribution of the species. So the pluses represent the observed locations, and the gray is what is known of the distribution. But the actual distribution may be greater um, than what we know. So we don't have any plus signs in that A circle. And the potential distribution might also be greater. So there's suitable habitat in B, but the species isn't there at all. And this could be because there are limitations that are keeping the species from occupying that habitat. So it could be dispersal constraints or biotic interactions, historical events like glaciers or a volcano. Um, many different processes could keep an organism from occupying all suitable habitats. And then in on the right, it's showing environmental space where we have two different axes. So we could think of them potentially as being precipitation or temperature, which are sometimes thought to um, be limiting factors in where a species is found. And so we take the observed species occurrence records and plot them in this environmental space. And those, so those are the pluses over on the right. And then again, we can also map the actual distribution and the potential distribution with the gray area and the, the circle. So when the model is created, what we're doing is drawing a circle around those observed species occurrence records. So that's the blue circle now shown in environmental space. And when we create the model and we're making maps on the landscape, we're putting that back into geographical space. And as you can see, as we move back into geographical space, um, the blue circle doesn't include all of the actual or all of the potential habitat. So it doesn't match perfectly, but it can be useful. For example, if you search in part two now within that blue circle, you would find an unknown population of the species. But it's also important to keep in mind that if we went to search in 
polygon 3 within that blue circle, we wouldn't find the species, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not suitable. So there's important caveats to keep in mind related to how these types of models work. Another way to think about what limits where a species can actually live is what's known as the BAM diagram that's shown here. And so the three main areas that are thought to control where a species is found are um, biotic conditions. So what biotic conditions are favorable for a species? And these could either be positive or negative interactions. So um, is there competition with another species would be an example of a negative interaction. Also, the abiotic conditions, so what kind of environmental conditions exist, and do they allow the, the species to survive? <clears throat> and then also the movement of the organism. So what geographic areas are accessible to a species? Is there some sort of um, factor keeping them from, from moving to a region? So it's also important to be able to assess the models that are created. So there are different ways to assess species distribution models. These in can include statistical assessment, but also just a simple assessment of whether or not the species makes sense or the model makes sense based on what is known about a species. So here's an example of a picture of polar bears in the tropics. So if we're making a species distribution model for a polar bear and it says that it's found in the tropics, then there's probably something wrong with our, our model. So it's good to go and evaluate um, just based on knowledge. It's also important to evaluate caveats associated with models. So um, thinking about the, the location data that you have, is there sampling bias? Like was there a whole region that was missed in sampling? Um, is there an important predictor that's missing that might that either just isn't available or you didn't think of that might be really important for a species of interest. And there's also various methodological choices that can be made along the way that can affect model predictions and are important to acknowledge. So next I'm gonna talk about ways to create species distribution models. So there are several different tools that are available to generate these types of models. And one of the tools that I'm going to focus on today is the VizTrails software for assisted habitat modeling software. So this software is an open source, freely, freely available software. Um, the software for assisted habitat modeling is a set of modules that we call SOM that is found within the VizTrails software package. Um, some of the advantages or, yeah, some of the reasons you might want to use SOM relate to uh, its ability to track the provenance of your model. So where does it come from? What's it based on? Um, there's also the tracking of the history of everything that has been done within creating the models. And this also can help with reproducibility. And there's also a geographical user interface that can make it easier to use for people that aren't comfortable writing code to create models. And so there's a picture shown here of the, the user interface. This picture shows a standard SOM workflow. And the standard workflow includes modules to input data. This includes both occurrence data and rasters to be used as predictor layers. There's also another set of modules related to pre-processing. And these sets of modules can help um, get all the raster layers to line up and that sort of thing, which can be helpful. There's another set of modules related to preliminary model analysis and decisions. 
that can help you decide which predictors to use within the model and uh, with splitting data for assessment. There are six different modeling routines included. And these include booster regression trees, generalized linear models, multivariate adaptive regression splines, random forest, and max end. There's also another modeling routine not listed here where uh, users can create their own curves. So if you do have information like the physiological relationship of a species, you can um, draw those curves to create a model as well. And then there's another set of modules within the modeling routines that allows you to apply your model to either different geographic areas or to um, different time periods or to a different set of location data to evaluate the model performance. There's also a set of output routines that assist with visualization of model results. And you don't have to use all of these different modules in creating a model. You could pick and choose. You could start in the middle. You could only use the top part. Um, and the output from the models includes textual output, graphical output, um, and all of these are consistent across the different modeling algorithms, including the way that assessment metrics are calculated. And the models also produce maps at the end. So this software is freely available. There is a manuscript in ecography that's shown here that describes the initial release of the Vistrel Psalm software. There's also a user's guide and tutorial along with other training materials av available online. So in conclusion, there is no universally correct way to create species distribution models. How you create a model will depend on the available data and intended use. So the methodology should be adapted to the ecological and biogeographical situation um, to meet the study goals. So what are the questions being asked? For example, if you want to know where a species is now, remote sensing data might, most be, might be most appropriate versus um, if you're interested in prediction, other ones may be better. And the methodology should also be adapted based on the available data. This trail SOM, again, is one software option. Species distribution models are used for a variety of things on their own, as I showed at the beginning of this presentation, but they could also be added into other tools. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Brian to talk about simulation models. Thanks a lot, Catherine, for uh, getting us off and running here. And uh, folks will just bear with us for a moment while we transition uh, the slides over to me. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, another type of modeling or another modeling approach uh, that can be used for eco forecasting. Um, and first, to kind of kick that off, um, I'd like to describe how uh, this, this technique, simulation modeling, uh, relates to species distribution modeling, what Catherine was just uh, describing for us. Um, so as, as she mentioned, these are, or species distribution models, are correlative models for uh, looking at the relationship between abiotic variables, um, like climate, and the occurrence of a species. Um, and it's become a uh, common practice to use these uh, to assess potential shifts uh, of species under climate change, and often operating at fairly large uh, spatial scales. And so in, in a way, it's, it's quite useful um, and applicable to a broad array of fields. But I will add that, um, and as Catherine alluded to and mentioned in her slides, this approach doesn't predict where a species will actually occur in the future. Um, but rather, it predicts locations where 
climatic conditions will be suitable for the species under future projections. Um, and part of the reason that it isn't telling us uh, exactly where we could find a species now or in the future uh, is because it doesn't account for uh, a variety of other uh, processes, uh, including things like disturbance, uh, competition among species, um, or management actions. And so really uh, representing those kinds of dynamics and properties is a strength of simulation models. So what are simulation models? Um, they are, in essence, a computer-based prototype of the real world. Um, and for any of you who uh, were playing computer games, uh, especially back in the 90s, uh, you might be familiar with the game SimCity. I think it's actually still uh, available today. So. Um, although I haven't, I have to admit I haven't checked, um, but I think this game was uh, initially released in the late 80s. Um, and essentially what it is or was um, is a virtual city building game. So you were the mayor of a city, you built the city and managed it uh, through this software platform. And so in a sense, that is a type of simulation model. Now, uh, the cities aren't necessarily based on any uh, actual uh, sort of location or um, to my knowledge, any particular data about a city or, or city um, properties of a city, but it gives you a flavor for what a simulation model is, is like. And there are plenty of uh, types of actual simulation models that people use uh, for understanding uh, the real world. Um, and these simulation models take a lot of different forms. They cover lots of different topics, uh, including climate, as we heard about uh, in the talk a few weeks ago from Helen. Uh, she described how climate simulation models work. There are also demographic models for, for populations, uh, biogeochemistry models, and then a whole suite of vegetation models uh, that represent uh, vegetation dynamics, among other things. And today, in a few slides here, I'm going to be talking specifically about one kind of simulation model, and that's the last one listed there, the state and transition simulation models. But before I do that, um, I wanted to kind of uh, talk just a bit more generally about why simulation models are useful um, in and of themselves, or sort of generally speaking. Uh, for one thing, they're generally quite good at integrating diverse data types. Um, and by doing that, uh, it can help us to identify data gaps. So by pulling together all of our sort of existing information, it can help us to realize the things that we don't know. And if we use sensitivity analyses to look at how influential those data gaps are on our outcome of interest, it can help us to identify really influential uncertainties uh, in our system. And that's really point to sort of opportunities for uh, further research. Simulations have also proven uh, quite useful at reproducing complex system dynamics. Things like thresholds, uh, feedbacks among system components, and the emergence of more complex patterns from very simple rules. And so by being able to reproduce these complex inter interactions and dynamics, it can help us to understand the, sort of the fundamental processes that underlie the systems that we are interested in, whether they're social or ecological or otherwise. And so by sort of building up these uh, virtual worlds, if you will, uh, we can use those then as sort of laboratories to ask what if kinds of questions. So what if we tweak this aspect of the system or implement um, a particular kind of management action? How might that play out uh, in, this, um, in this virtual laboratory? So in a way, it can help us to, to experiment a bit, um, but without you know, sort of making changes or modifications to, to real world systems. But they also have, uh, like any modeling technique, uh, they do have limitations as well. Um, so you know, last week I talked with you all about uh, scenario planning. And these simulations, as we'll discuss here uh, in the coming slides, can be used for exploring different scenarios. But they aren't uh, particularly attuned to developing the scenarios themselves. And that's really the strength of that qualitative scenario planning approach that I described last week. And they aren't able to to capture everything, although they are indeed good at integrating diverse data types and representing lots of different kinds of um, interactions uh, between species and biotic and biotic um, components, they aren't going to capture everything. 
And you know, they're also they're complementary to species distribution models because, um, in a sense, they're not as as good at or attuned to statistical analysis as something like a species distribution model, which is really allowing us to develop the statistical relationships between um, biotic and abiotic components. That's not so much the strength of simulations. And finally, um, you know, sometimes when we build simulations and take them to um, our management partners or, or fellow scientists we might be working with, sometimes people expect them to sort of give us the one right answer. And more often than not, that's, that's not the case. Um, particularly if we're exploring multiple scenarios that are sort of equally likely, um, we're not going to come up with one sort of final solution. Um, but rather, it'll give us an idea of sort of the ranges of uncertainty um, among different possible futures and can help us guide our decision making. But the ultimate sort of decisions about which actions to implement or not will be um, more based on, on our, our value systems and sort of um, constraints and, and opportunities. So now I'm going to talk more specifically about one type of simulation model, and that, are, that is state and transition simulation models. So state and transition simulations were put forward um, as a way of representing landscapes. Um, and sort of the seminal piece on state and transition models is from Westaby et al. Uh, from 1989, uh, cited there at the bottom of the slide. Um, and sort of the way that they conceived of state and transition models uh, were as really conceptualizations of uh, ecosystems, whereby uh, vegetation communities could be grouped into states, uh, represented here in this diagram by boxes, um, and then any kind of process uh, that could move vegetation between those states um, would be represented as an arrow, say, in this diagram. And the transitions um, really represent sort of the probabilistic occurrence of a series of events during a specified time period um, that would result in a change in state. And examples of, the, of, of transitions um, include fires, um, invasion by, uh, say, an exotic species, um, management actions like logging or something like that. So really um, quite flexible in terms of what the models themselves can represent. So again, state and transition models initially were conceived of as these conceptual kind of box and arrow diagrams. But in recent years, uh, we've sort of taken these state and transition conceptual models and, and moved them into a simulation modeling framework. So using um, software, we can take these models and um, parameterize them in ways that we can look at landscape conditions through time and through space. So you'd start still with, with some kind of box and arrow diagram like this simple one project or, uh, shown here with three different state classes and a variety of different transitions. And then to actually turn this into a simulation model, you do need a couple of pieces of information. So for your model inputs, you'll need the transition probabilities or, or targets, um, as well as the area in each of your state classes at some starting point, whether that's today or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And those are the two main things that you need. Now, uh, you'll note that when it comes to transitions, there are a couple of different types. Some are indeed probabilistic. So for instance, as shown here, the likelihood of fire has a certain probability in any given year. Other transitions like succession might be determined based on the age of the state class. So you might want your model to track the age of the vegetation groups through time so that when they hit a particular age, in this case, say a shrub state class hits age 10, it will become forest. And then there are um, transitions like those shown with the blue and the red arrows that represent management uh, actions, which, which may have a target rather than a probability. So you might say, well, within our jurisdiction, we know that we do X acres or X hectares of construction or reclamation per year. So those are some of the different kinds of transitions that you might represent within your model with different parameters. And after parameterizing the model and allowing it to run forward through time, it'll tell you something about how much of the landscape is in each of those state classes over time and how much is transitioned. And importantly, uh, it is sort of projecting these vegetation dynamics with some range of uncertainty because they are stochastic or probability-based simulation models, you don't get the exact same answer each time that you run it. 
So you want to run it a number of times. So to give you a bit of more of a clear a clearer idea of um, what these models, um, how they operate, uh, let me go into just a, a little bit more detail. So um, you have some initial landscape uh, here that's represented by this grid um, of cells, and there are three different state classes. And you can see that uh, this, in this case, uh, there are also ages assigned to each of those, represented by the numbers here. And I should add that as you implement uh, state and transition simulation models, remote sensing data are really valuable uh, for initializing the landscape. For instance, you might draw on um, land cover maps in order to sort of set the initial uh, landscape. Um, and also for calculating transition probabilities. Uh, for instance, you might look at um, a fire database to look at uh, how uh, the, re the recurrence time of fires on a given landscape. So um, for this gridded landscape, you, you start with some landscape at time equals zero. Um, and then for each of these little boxes, each of the cells on the landscape, uh, the simulation software will look at what transitions are available for that particular um, state class. For instance, here we're looking at a mixed wood uh, forest cell um, with an age of 16 years. Um, and the model can look and say, well, um, based on that state class and location, it has these possible transitions and it will track through time any of the transitions that do indeed occur based on the probabilities and management targets you've specified. And so ultimately, at some later time point that you've defined as kind of your endpoint, um, it will provide you with um, an output landscape. And I should add that these, the transition probabilities um, can vary over space and over time, and I'll talk a bit more about that here in a moment. But again, because each, of the each time that you run the model, you get a slightly different answer, you want to run the, the model multiple times using what are called different Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and these give you the uncertainty estimates in your forecasts or projections. And the paper reference here provides um, sort of some more detailed um, and really nice overview of, of how these simulation models work if you'd like a bit more information. I will point out a couple of optional model features that can be quite useful um, and also represent sort of other opportunities to leverage remote sensing data. Um, so the models can represent spatial autocorrelation. For instance, you might recognize that um, if you have a certain amount of fire on the landscape in a given year, it's not going to necessarily occur just at various random disconnected points across the landscape, but rather a fire might ignite in one place and then spread from there. And that spread could be dictated by, again, remote sensing data such as elevation layers. You can also vary over space and over time uh, the transition probabilities. So for instance, if you expect fire to become more likely as climate shifts through time, you might increase the probability of fire over your landscape. And you can also vary your management targets uh, spatially and temporally. So in this example here with two different uh, planning zones, uh, we might note that in zone one, they have a very different exotic species management strategy than in zone two, and we could implement that um, by specifying different targets or treatment approaches. And so because of that ability, it gives us a really nice platform for simulating different uh, climate and management scenarios. So um, here's a, just an example model, or really a portion of, of an example model, and I don't at all expect you to be able to read uh, the boxes or make any of the connections here among this really complicated set of arrows and boxes. Um, but I do want to use a portion of this uh, for, for illustrating a potential connection to species distribution models. So each of these arrows has some um, parameter. Uh, or either a transition probability or an age-based transition or a management target. And so to parameterize a model like this, you need to have information for each one of those areas, arrows. And oftentimes we can pull this information from the published literature or previous experimental or field research. Um, but in some cases, we may not have that information. Uh, and so what I would urge you to do if you do go ahead with building these models is to carefully document um, all of your parameters and the sources of those parameters, including places where you're making assumptions or educated guesses, so that later, um, particularly with those more uncertain variables, you can do some sensitivity analyses 
see how important that uncertainty is and how it affects your outcomes. But once you've built out the pathways and parameterized the model, you, you could certainly run it uh, forward through time. Um, but one sort of uh, connection here that's worth mentioning is that we can also parameterize the model using gridded output from species distribution <coughs> models, excuse me. So let me zoom in on one portion of this diagram. So within this initial part of the model, we have a, um, a state class uh, for a particular species called white bark pine. Uh, where there is a, it's a sort of the presence of a seed. And the likelihood of whether or not that will become a seedling uh, can be based on the habitat suitability maps from a species distribution model. And indeed, um, that's what we used in this example. We had a species distribution model tell us where on the landscape, or rather at each of the locations on the landscape, um, how likely it would be that a seedling could establish there, given a set of abiotic conditions. And not only could we specify these probabilities and vary them over space, but we can also vary them through time. So as climate is shifting, where will the habitat, the suitable habitat uh, occur on the landscape, and thus where will this particular tree species be able to establish? And furthermore, we can e explore different climate scenarios, um, different representative concentration pathways, or we could even look at different global climate model output to say, hey, you know, if the world turns out uh, as it might under this uh, emission scenario, then where would the suitable habitat be versus this other emission scenario? So in other words, we can take the output of species distribution models, use those gridded uh, layers as input for our state and transition simulation. So um, sort of to summarize, my point on this slide is that these models can serve as a really nice way to organize our thinking and integrate existing knowledge, including output from other modeling types. Now, when it comes to model output, um, if you do build a spatially explicit state and transition simulation, you could, of course, have um, map output, as is shown here on the right. Um, you can also look at tabular or graphical summaries. Um, but I would urge you, uh, if you do, again, go ahead and, and sort of explore using state and transition simulations, I'd suggest that uh, you run your model for a historical time period and, if possible, compare it against uh, existing data to sort of do a validation check on your model and if it's operating as you might expect. And this is, again, another good opportunity where you can use remote sensing data uh, to validate model output. And there are software available um, to sort of facilitate this modeling approach. Um, similar to VizTrail SOM, uh, there is free software available, um, and it's available for building and running state and transition simulations. That's specifically what it's created for. Um, it was released in 2013, and um, if you've heard of TELSA or VDDT, this is sort of the next generation uh, of those software platforms, and it's known as STSIM. Um, and it's under active development by the creators of the software, so they are consistently maintaining and putting out new versions. Um, and it's also actively being used by the research community. Um, this number may, in fact, be out of date by now, uh, but there have been at least 15 peer-reviewed publications using this software platform since 2014. If you want to learn more about the software, um, I'd suggest that uh, you go to synchrosim.com, website shown here. Um, and if you scroll down on that page uh, to the Getting Started section, you'll find a link to uh, video tutorials. And I believe they have three of them up there right now, which are really nice. Um, they walk through sort of different levels of complexity, the first being an overview of state and transition simulation models, particularly within STSIM. The second actually helps you kind of get started with using the software. And then the third one is about um, implementing implementing uh, spatial models within STSIM, so a really nice resource. And that uh, wiki page, the synchrosim.com page, um, also has lots of additional information uh, relating to kind of the broader user community. Uh, they list publications uh, using the STSIM software. Um, they also have information on upcoming uh, trainings and user group meetings. Uh, for instance, we have one coming in November here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and you can find more information about that course and user group meeting there. Um, and because we have this active community of researchers, they also maintain a, uh, a forum on the APEX RMS 
uh, com website uh, where you can sort of post questions uh, and, and things like that and look at existing um, uh, questions and answers that have been posted to the forum. So to kind of wrap up this portion of our uh, webinar today, um, state and transition simulation models, I think their strength really in, in simulation models in general is integrating existing knowledge and thereby figuring out, you know, what don't we know and what do we need to do additional uh, research, either field or experimental or otherwise. Um, and also by building these models, we can use them as, as virtual laboratories for exploring different what-if questions um, and looking at different climate and management scenarios. And really, simulation models, I think, by themselves aren't necessarily sort of the be-all, end-all of modeling approaches, um, but they are quite good at leveraging the strengths of other methods, uh, methods like species distribution modeling. And I think together, uh, combining methods such as those, uh, we can get a much better handle um, looking at the future of various species um, and uh, things that we care about in the environment. So with that, I'll say thank you, um, and I will go ahead and pass the screen over to Elizabeth, and I believe we'll, we'll take some time here to uh, do our best to answer some of your questions. And I think Catherine and I will sort of uh, take turns uh, doing that, depending on uh, the question, we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, to answer them for you. Great. Thank you, Brian and Catherine. Um, this is Amber McCollum again. And as we transition into the uh, question and answer session, I just want to thank you all for, for being with us in the webinar series. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we will have a survey that we will be sending you all uh, via email. So we would really appreciate it if you took the time to provide us with some feedback about this uh, webinar and um, give us suggestions on how to improve in the future and um, give us ideas of, of other topics you'd like to see covered. Um, so I just wanted to mention that quickly. And um, it looks like a lot of you are also uh, communicating with one another by putting your name and email address. So you can continue to do that. And we um, will show that within the um, question um, tab in your browser as well. So um, we have about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. And um, I will let. Catherine and Brian take over here to answer some of your questions. Thank you. This is Great. Catherine. I could start out with question one. So is there a remote sensing product data that could be used to study distribution of Kentucky bluegrass, for example, in the state of Wyoming, or in North Dakota? Sorry. Um, and the answer to that was, I think, as long as it's spectrally distinct at a certain time of year from the other vegetation, um, that similar methods could be used as have been done in other studies. So the uh, example that I reference with cheatgrass in Wyoming would be one published manuscript that you could look at that has uh, the methods really well laid out that could be used as a, a template to follow for other species. Great. Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, I'll take a crack here um, at question four. Um, and Elizabeth, I'm sorry, we may have to kind of do a bit of scrolling in between our questions since I suspect the questions for the second half of the talk will be toward the bottom and, and Catherine's might be toward the top. Um, yeah, so question four, how many times do you recommend running the stochastic models? Uh, this is a good and I think common question uh, for folks working with simulation models. Um, I don't know of a magic number that sort of is applicable across uh, simulations, but uh, a few, I guess, considerations. One is, uh, you know, how complicated um, and how much uh, uncertainty is built into your model that might dictate sort of the range of uncertainty that you might get in your outcomes and thus the number of times uh, that you might want to run it. Um, but I think typically as a general rule of thumb, uh, I've heard that uh, you would want to run the model for at least 40 or 50, 50 different uh, iterations or Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and if you can run it at least 100 times, uh, that's you know, even better. Um, but of course, the number of times that you're able to run the simulation uh, can of oftentimes be dictated by uh, the runtime. So if you have a very complicated model 
it might take a lot of computing capacity and take a really long time to even do a single uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And so if that's the case, you may be limited in the number of times that you can run the model. And so, um, you know, sometimes your hands are tied and you can only do it, uh, you know, a few times and so be it, but at least document uh, the number of iterations that you run uh, so that people can better interpret uh, the ranges of uncertainty uh, in your simulations. I'm going to go ahead and answer question three really quickly. Is the Psalm software free license and can we download it? Is there a quick link for that? Yes is the answer to that. Um, the easiest way to find it, I think, is if you go to my.usgs.gov slash catalog slash RAM slash Psalm. And that's also on slide 19 in the presentation. All right, so I'll um, take a look here at question number six. Um, can you provide some context on the breadth of applications of STSMs, state and transition simulation models, for management decision making? How broadly are they being applied both in agencies in the United States and abroad? So um, state and transition simulation models, I would say, are um, you know, sort of really gaining momentum uh, in their application, um, but in some ways are really still being used uh, by fairly few folks. I don't think they have quite as broad recognition as something like species distribution models, um, but gaining that recognition and that thus I think we're seeing broader and broader applications through time. A common application um, is to look at exotic species spread and management. Uh, it, that's been done a number of times here in the United States. Um, increasingly, folks are using them to look at uh, responses to climate change and, and doing so in a couple of different ways. Um, these models can now be used to, to track uh, carbon dynamics uh, on the landscape through what's called a, a stock and flow uh, module within state and transition simulation models. Um, in other cases, it's more sort of related to the management of um, things like um, mountain pine beetle and how that affects um, forests in the western United States. Um, uh, another example would be uh, the use of state and transition simulations to look at the composition and productivity of grassland species and how that's affected by different grazing and fire um, and management scenarios. So to give you a bit of a flavor of the types of systems and questions we're looking at, it's, it's really been um, sort of growing. Uh, so initially these were used for rangeland systems. In a lot of cases they still are used for those applications, but increasingly being used for other systems like um, subalpine forest, boreal forest. Um, some folks are even using them to project land use changes uh, through time. Um, and I have to admit that uh, I I don't know of any international applications beyond uh, their use in Canada, but of course uh, I'd welcome either Catherine or others to jump in if they do know about some of the international applications. I don't know of any other, of any international applications, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any. Um, I'll move back up to question five. Is it possible to employ this trail psalm for determining river hydraulics influence on the ecological habitat of a river? And I'll preface my answer by saying that I don't really work in river systems, but I would assume from what I know that rivers are, are much more linear and it's important to have information on like movement upstream, downstream, and that sort of thing doesn't work well within the type of models that, that SOM does. And I would assume that there's probably other types of models that might work better in river systems. <laughs> 
Okay, and I'll jump to question nine, uh, which is, aren't there any plugins for R and QGIS uh, that we can use to create scenarios and create state and transition models? I guess I'll start by saying uh, I don't know. There very well may be, um, but I, I really recommend uh, the use of the software program that I mentioned, STSIM, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it, it's free, um, which is a bonus, um, but it's also really um, user-friendly. Um, there is not, in my view, there's not a steep learning curve. You don't need to learn a programming language um, in order to use the STSIM. Uh, much of it can be done through a graphical user interface. Um, and as I said, they're under, you know, sort of constantly uh, improving and developing that software platform. So to my mind, that's really um, uh, the gold standard in terms of state and transition simulation modeling software. And I'd recommend uh, that folks uh, check it out if you're uh, seriously considering building uh, state and transition simulation models. Um, and as far as sort of creating scenarios, um, I don't think there's really any software program that will allow you to create scenarios uh, in a meaningful way, or I guess in a way that's as um, sort of vetted and um, you know, broadly used as scenario planning, as I described last week. Uh, of course, there are probably plenty of software programs that can be used to quantitatively explore those different scenarios, but in terms of creating uh, scenarios, I think it's um, really the strength of the more qualitative participatory scenario planning approach um, that we talked about last week. Okay, I'm going to move back up to question seven. So is it possible with Psalm software to use several models and then see which is the best of them? And the answer is yes. So you can run all of those different models that I showed in the presentation. So there's six different ones now. And so you can run them all with the, the same data. You can adjust the, the parameters for each individual model algorithm as you need to, and then you get comparable output for all of them. And so you can compare them and determine if there's one that seems to be working better than the other ones. I'll jump to question 10. Um, I, I'm thinking I can clarify this just really quickly. Um, the question is, what is STSM model? Um, and I apologize if I didn't uh, clarify that acronym, which I'm sure that I used in the slides. So STSM just stands for State and Transition Simulation Model. Okay, I'm going to go back up to question eight. Um, so are the species distribution models able to handle migrating species or mainly just primarily resident ones? And the applications that I've seen of the type of species distribution models that I talked about today for migrating species involve creating a different model for the different times of year. So create a model for winter habitat, create a model for summer habitat. And so they can be used for migrating species, but you end up with several different models that you can piece together to look at um, what habitat is needed across the year. Okay, uh, let's take a look here at question number 11. Uh, can you provide an example or references of the state and transition models in pelagic fisheries or biological oceanography? Uh, again, I'll just say that um, I'm not aware of any um, marine uh, applications of state and transition simulation models. They're typically used for looking at terrestrial vegetation dynamics. Um, that's not to say it would be impossible to do some kind of uh, a marine application. Um, but uh, again, to my knowledge, to date, all the applications have been for terrestrial vegetation. Okay, 
Let's see, so question 13, any, question, any suggestions for incorporating pollen and seed dispersal into species distribution models? Um, I have seen dispersal kernels included as a predictor in models. And I've also seen a species distribution model created for habitat suitability for a species, and then that overlaid with some sort of um, seed dispersal. I'm not sure about incorporating pollen. I don't remember seeing anything related to that. And then I'll also mention that one of the ways ways that the state and transition simulation models that Brian talked about can be useful is that you can use that habitat suitability model as an input and you then you can simulate things like dispersal across the landscape. Well, I think we've answered most of the questions here. Um, and I know that um, Amber mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you're welcome to email questions uh, to her. Um, we can also uh, sort of be in touch with Amber and, and try our best to answer any of those questions that come in later. Um, but um, I guess with that, I'll say thank you and, and maybe pass it over to, uh, to Amber, unless uh, Catherine has anything else she wanted to, uh, to say or address here. Nope. Oh, thank you very much, everyone. Great. Well, thank you, um, Catherine and Brian, for a really great presentation. We appreciate you uh, providing that with us and answering our questions. And um, just to wrap up, again, we'll provide the question and answers on the website. Um, and tomorrow, I believe, you can expect to receive an email with a survey link. So again, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to um, complete the surveys. That provides us with a lot of um, helpful feedback. And again, if there are further questions, feel free to email me. My um, email address is listed in the presentation as well. And um, we thank you for your time today.